Some powerful images from India as students protest the terrorist attack at a Pakistani school. The children stood with a black ribbon tied to their mouths in an act of solidarity. Welcome back to The Heat. The attack in Peshawar has been called the worst in Pakistan's history. 132 children and at least nine adults were killed when gunmen strapped with explosives stormed a military school in northwestern Pakistan. We continue our conversation now with Pakistan's former ambassador to the United States, Hussein Haqqani. Joining us from Philadelphia is Bill Roggio. He's a senior fellow at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies. Here in Washington in the studio with me is Faranaz Ispahani. She served as a member of the Pakistani parliament and is now a scholar at the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. Faranaz, I want to come with a question to you, but first, you know, it's, it's a tragedy that's brought into stark relief when we realize that just a week ago, a young Pakistani girl, Malala Yousafzai, was awarded the Nobel Prize for Peace for the, her efforts at bringing peace to the country. She was, in fact, shot by the Taliban at one time. She recovered. Let's take a listen first to what she had to say about this tragedy. My family and I are heartbroken after hearing the news that more than 100 innocent children and teachers have lost their lives in this recent attack on a school in Peshawar. And uh, we stand with all those families and all those children who are injured right now and who are suffering through this big trauma. And, and now it is time that we unite. And I call upon the international community, leaders in Pakistan, all political parties and everyone that we should stand up together and fight against terrorism. And we should make sure that every child get safe and quality education. Great words there from Malala Yousafzai. Farnas, what is the ultimate aim of the Pakistani Taliban? I think the Pakistani Taliban, what they want is not unlike what ISIS wants, what the Islamic State or Daesh want. They want Sharia. Every single school of this kind, a secular school or, you know, these national schools which have a non-religious education to them is a Western secular school promoting American or Western ideas. They want Sharia where young girls like Malala, a proud, proud, proud Nobel laureate, um, who they shot through the head for attempting to go to school, does not leave the house to have an education. They don't want anything that they see as different to, you know, the, their idea, their barbaric interpretation of an Islamic way of life. So they are not going to stop. So that's why I think it is so dangerous, what this, this game that's being played. I remember Hillary Clinton saying she held a press conference with our former um, foreign minister in Pakistan. And she said, she said, when you keep snakes in your backyard, you know, you can't just imagine that they're going to bite your neighbors or attack your neighbors. And I thought Mrs. Clinton, and this was several years ago, summed up the situation beautifully, but nothing's moved on. So the message from the United States and the West has been conveyed. But when I see young Malala, the promise in Pakistan of the youth, it is so moving. And that's the promise that they were trying to wipe out today. Yeah, that's a great analogy you made there, citing uh, Hillary Clinton. Uh, Bill, let me ask you this. Who gives the orders and who takes the orders in Pakistan? Is it the military giving orders to the civilian government or is it the other way around? Well, I, I think my esteemed uh, colleagues on the program could probably answer that question better than I. But my view is it's the military and the, the in, inner service intelligence uh, directorate are the ones that run the real show. They're the real powers that be in, inside Pakistan. And they direct all policy with regards to dealing with jihadist groups, it, it, without a doubt. Because if the, if the military wanted to, to remove these groups, they wanted to stop supporting these groups and, and, and destroy them. Look, the reality is the military and intelligence services, they know where group guys like Jalaluddin, Siraj Haqqani, the head of the Haqqani network are, and they can, wrap, they can put them in prison or, or kill them in, within a day. And the fact that that doesn't happen tells me everything that I know about who runs the show inside Pakistan. Well, let me get the ambassador's view on that. Ambassador, is there a lack of will on the part of the military to get rid of the Taliban? 
I think that uh, it is both a lack of will and a lack of capacity, but I think it's above all confusion. It's yesterday's policies being pursued today without regard for tomorrow. Uh, there was a time when it may have made sense to some people, it didn't make sense to me even then, that Pakistan could use some jihadis for regional influence. After the Soviets left Afghanistan, Pakistan should have asked the international community to help it, just as it had been helped to create the jihadi, jihadi groups, to demobilize them. That's what happened when the uh, Indians helped Mukti Bahini fight uh, for Bangladesh. That's what helped when the Americans uh, helped the Nicaraguans, uh, the Contras. You always demobilize irregular forces. Instead, Pakistan continued to use the irregular forces uh, in Kashmir, in Afghanistan. Uh, and now there are people who are just totally wedded to the idea of these groups and keep making distinctions among them. And the national discourse has become so confused about the subject that even the civilian leaders can't make a clear decision. Faranaz rightly pointed out about Imran Khan and the confusion he has sowed in the minds of young people. Uh, we have already seen, it's hardly been a, a day since the attack happened, and we are already seeing a large number of conspiracy theories about how these could not have been the Taliban and might actually have been agents of India, Israel, the United States, or zombies from outer space. Basically, this conspiracy theory mania makes it very difficult, even for a strong military chief who wants to change the direction, to be able to change it. Let us hope that this incident does change the discussion in Pakistan. And if there are people in the army and the ISI high command who want to change things, they are able to do them now. Farhan, we talk about changing strategies, shifts in, the, in political power in Pakistan, etc. But, you know, when you think of ordinary Pakistanis, ordinary people, the parents of these children who died today, um, what is going to be the short-term impact of this? Are they now going to keep their children at home, afraid to send them to school? The fear is, yes, um, as it is Peshawar almost doesn't belong, the writ of the state and that's the capital of one of our four provinces, is almost out of the control of the local government. And um, so the fear that already exists there, and for these parents, there are some parents who lost one child and one child lived. Uh, they are going to, there's going to be mourning, and then many people in Peshawar today, Anand, anybody who can, they are moving anywhere they can outside the province leaving their homes, leaving their communities, leaving everything. It's war. And it's a war where, um, you know, a weak, inept, or perhaps a leadership without enough will, and um, an army leadership which really has to straighten up. Because soon the neighbors of Pakistan are now at a point where, whether it's Prime Minister Modi of India, um, uh, Mr. Um, former President Karzai was very strong about this. The Iranians have warned us, the Chinese have hinted now, um, after all the issues they're having in, you know, in China with the Uyghurs, etc., that enough is enough, Pakistan, because they don't like what we're exporting to their country. So my fear is that if Pakistan doesn't deal with this ourselves, if we don't care about our own children dying, at least be worried about the sanctity of the state. At least worry about what your neighbors who are at their last, you know, um, at, the, at the end of their wits. Let me go to the ambassador. And ambassador, we just have about 40 seconds left. And there's something I'd like you to address. Pakistan is a nuclear power. It has nuclear weapons. Do you think there'll be far more concern in places like Washington, London, Paris, and other Western capitals about what is going on in Pakistan now, given that this is a nuclear state? Well, because it's a nuclear weapon, its people and its government should feel more secure, not less. Unfortunately, this attitude of insecurity that we have bred, uh, that somehow India will finish off Pakistan or Afghanistan will be able to conspire against Pakistan and to combat them, we need an asymmetrical warfare to remain regionally powerful, is an absurd concept. Yes, 
the United States and the rest of the world are all very concerned about Pakistan's status as a nuclear weapons power, but Pakistan could transform that into its strength. We have nuclear weapons, so therefore we do not need to go to war with anyone. We are protected. Now let us pay attention to our country, our people, make sure our children can go to school, make sure that we do not have anybody who's outside the writ of the state, and we have a peaceful environment for a successful economy. Unfortunately, those thoughts have uh, taken a backseat to strategic uh, compulsions that I consider to have been from an era when we did not have nuclear weapons and therefore felt insecure. Okay, and that's where we are going to have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for joining us.